29 is our text. This is what it says. And when Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as their scribes. What I want to do this morning is I want to address the topic of authority, what authority we have as individuals. And this is an important topic because there is no greater cruelty than the abuse of authority of Thomas Addison or Joseph Addison who penned these words 250 years ago. He said, no oppression is so heavy or lasting than that which is inflicted by the perversion of legal authority. Why is this important? Because how many wives have been beaten down by husbands who demand biblical submission? How many children have been abused by out-of-control parents? How many churches have been destroyed by pastors that have run amok? Keith Richards was a, um, one of the original singers of the Rolling Stones, and he was a man that was abused as a child, and that abuse led to an adulthood that was full of li- uh, booze and drugs and a seething hatred for authority. In one of his concerts, he yelled out to the crowd, he said, um, if you're going to kick authority in the face, you might as well use both of your feet um, and knock it out. If you've studied history, you're familiar with the man by the name of Joseph Stalin. He was um, someone that led, um, he was a man that led the Soviet Union for over a quarter of a century with an iron fist and ruled the 285 people that lived in the Soviet Union. His terrified followers called him Uncle Joe, but he was never anyone's favorite uncle. Stalin gave birth to history's bloodiest reign of terror. He once joked with the head of the KJB, he said, a single murder, that's a tragedy, but a million, that's only a statistic. And in his reign, more than 100,000 priests, um, monks, and nuns were murdered as he tried to purge the Soviet Union from Christianity. 20 million people were executed, starved to death, liquidated, or exiled to die in the prison camps of Siberia. Stalin's power was so absolute that they nicknamed him the Red Czar because of the blood that he shed. His closest people, his inner circles, were terrified when he would walk into a room. In fact, even the most devoted, devoted atheist would make a sign of the cross in a sigh of relief when he would leave a room. A single word from Uncle Joe meant a bullet in the back of your head. British Lord Acton once warned the bishop of the Ang- Anglican Church. He said, power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Great men are always bad men, and that is incredibly true of Joseph Stalin. When he finally died, his inner circle and his family were with him in his room, and he tried to sway death away, but to no avail, and he died. And even as his closest inner circle people were hanging in the room with him, they left, and they were already plotting who would be the next ruler of Russia. And after a deadly power struggle, Nikita Khrushchev emerged as the undisputed dictator of the Soviet Union. And in his speech just a few years later, he shocked the nation by denouncing Joseph Stalin as an enemy of the people. And in his speech, he listed out the atrocities committed by Stalin and demanded that his memory be purged from the public record. The delegates of the Soviet Supreme listened in shocked silence as they listened to Khrushchev denounce the former leader, the dictator, and then someone shouted out and said, why didn't you do something to stop him? Why did you allow him to be so cruel and mean to the people? And Khrushchev glared at the audience in anger, and he pounded his fist angrily at the podium, and red-faced, he shouted, who said that? Who dare question me while I'm speaking? And all the delegates hung their heads in fear that the premier might pick them and humiliate them in front of the audience. And the auditorium was deadly silent as Khrushchev scanned the crowd and he yelled again, Speak up! Who has the audacity to question me? 
And after what seemed like an eternity of time, Khrushchev smirked and said, now you know why no one ever did anything to stop Stalin. See, there's a power, there's an authority that intimidates, but it never outlives the demise of its tyrants. But there's also a power and authority that inspires. And it changes the world forever. The Sermon on the Mount is over. Last week, Shannon finished up the last section of Jesus' teaching. And now the sermon is done. Jesus has sat down. The people sit there in this wide, in this, in this kind of awed reverence, in this amazement. They knew that they were, they've just experienced something magical. More than 5,000 people know that they've heard the greatest sermon that has ever been preached. Let me read the text again. And when Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teachings. For he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as the scribes. This is the authority that Stalin and Khrushchev could only dream of having. Jesus' authority comes from within and from above. See, true authority doesn't come from a position or a title. It can't be grasped. It doesn't need to be trumpeted. It just is. You have it or you don't have it. And here's the takeaway principle that I want to leave you with this morning. It's that authority comes without seeking it and it's retained without effort. Authority comes without seeking it, and it's retained without effort. The late Prime Minister of Israel, Golda Meir, said that authority poisons everyone who tries to seize it. You can't take what you already don't have. You can call yourself the head of the house, but that doesn't necessarily make you so. You can tell everyone you're the boss, but that doesn't really mean that you're in charge. Academic degrees don't necessarily make you smart. Ordination to gospel ministry doesn't mean the good reverend is necessarily a good reverend. I love the quip by George Carlin when he said, I have as much authority as the Pope, I just don't have as many people to believe it. See, Jesus didn't end his Sermon on the Mount by saying, hey, you've got to believe everything I said because I'm the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He doesn't say that you've got to listen to what I've said because of who I am. He just said what he said, and then he sat down. He didn't rub up the crowd. He didn't do an altar call. He didn't promote himself. He didn't have to remind them of what they already knew, that he had authority. He didn't have to do any of that. Leonardo da Vinci said that nothing strengthens authority as much as silence. Listen, every man who wants to lead his family well, every mom who craves the best for her children, every boss who desires to build a good team and a work environment, every pastor who longs to raise a great church, and every civic leader or politician who wants to promote the public good, and every disciple of Jesus Christ who aspires to impact others for God's glory, you need to understand the authority of Jesus. Remember, authority comes not from seeking it, and it's not retained without effort. So how does that happen? In, in our text, let me give you five ways that we find, that we see the authority of Jesus. Number one, authority is strengthened by silence. Authority is strengthened by silence. Notice again verse 28, when Jesus finished his teachings, the crowds were amazed at his sayings. You know, I'm always amazed at the brevity of, of the Sermon of Jesus. You read Matthew 5, 6, and 7, it won't take you more than 25 to 30 minutes to read the entire text. That's probably how long Jesus took to preach the greatest sermon that was ever preached. Maybe 25 to 30 minutes. But it is packed with so much gospel concentrate that it's actually taken us as a congregation 22 weeks just to unpack everything that Jesus has taught here. And he, un he ends his sermon so abruptly. We learned last week, the rains came down, the streams rose, the winds blew, and the house crashed. The house was destroyed. 
No loose ends are tied up, no wrap up, no positive spin, no final appeal, no altar call, no closing song, no final benediction, no comforting line at the end. He gives his final line and he walks off the stage and we're left disturbed and we're left speechless and the last words ring in our ears. There was a great crash. End of story, end of sermon. Listen, I'll be honest with you, I struggle with this. And you guys know I struggle with this because at the end of my sermon, I'll stand up here and reiterate everything I said over and over and over just to make sure you knew what I was saying. But Jesus doesn't do that. He doesn't worry about closing the deal. He just told the truth and he sat down. One philosopher put it this way, he who who establishes his argument by noise and long appeal betrays that his reason is weak. Earlier in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is the one who taught that let your yes be yes and your no be no. Jesus would say to all of us who are parents and politicians and preachers and teachers and spouses that never-ending berating or criticizing or arguing or yelling or manipulating or frantic pleading, he would say that all of that is abusive. Trying to establish authority by intimidation is a sign of weakness. You're not a man of authority if you had to intimidate people. Real authority is calm and confident. It makes the case and then it sits down and it trusts that the Holy Spirit is, willing, is going to work in the hearts and lives of people that has been spoken to. Nothing strengths authority like silence. Number two, he who has no bread has no authority. He who has no bread has no authority. Listen, why do sheep follow a shepherd? Because the shepherd feeds them. The 23rd Psalm says, The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. People follow those who meet their needs. Sheep follow shepherds who lead them to green pastures. See, we never want to steal sheep away from other pastures, but we want to make sure that the grass that we're growing here is good grass. We want to make sure that it's grass that helps people grow. Hungry sheep go where they are fed. Shepherds who feed their sheep will have a growing flock. Look at verse 28 again. When Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were amazed at his teaching. The original Greek word for amazed there literally means to slam someone with a jolting blow. In modern language, you could say that Jesus just hammered them. He just gave them a knockout. Some versions of the Bible translates the word astonished. The crowds were astonished, which is a very good translation of this word. Our English word astonished comes from the Latin word, which means to strike with thunder. Jesus' listeners were awestruck. Great preaching is also great teaching. It shakes you to the core. It moves you deeply. You don't ever want that sermon to end. When it does, you can't shake it off of your mind. And sometimes it's not a good thing. Sometimes it disturbs you. Sometimes it makes you angry. Sometimes you have to chew on it all week because the Holy Spirit is dealing with you on on issues of your life. Great sermons will challenge you to change who you are. According to George Barna, who does research on Christians in the Christian community, 75% of evangelical Christians in America say that they haven't had a meaningful worship because worship experience in the last 12 months. Worse than that, 82% that the sermons that they hear are boring, trivial, and uninspiring. And I don't know if you're part of that 82%. If you are, meet me afterward. See, no wonder evangelicals switch churches so much. They are sheep looking desperately for shepherds to feed them. There's an old Turkish proverb that says that he who has no bread has no authority. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. Jesus served fresh bread to hungry people. Why were the people all struck at the teaching of Jesus? Look again at verse 28. Because he taught as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. The Greek word for teachers of the law literally literally is where we get the English word grammar from. It comes from the Greek word grapho, which is where we get graffiti or graphic. It means writings. 
What Jesus, what the people are saying is these people that they used to hear, these people that they studied or learned under, they were people who studied the teachings of other people. They always had their noses in in theology books. When they spoke, they quoted the great rabbinical teachers of the past. They got their authority from what other people said. I base my teachings on what Rabbi so-and-so said, or as the esteemed Rabbi said, now I teach you. They served up someone else's bread. And sometimes that bread was centuries old. And by definition, that bread is stale bread. It doesn't do anything for you. See, today we have teachers who teach, who establish their authority on what John Calvin said, or Martin Luther said, or St. Augustine said, or John MacArthur said, or John Piper said, or what some other favorite preacher of theirs says. And like the rabbinical scholars of Jesus' day, many teachers today are feeding their flock the stale bread that someone else fed their congregation weeks ago or months ago. And listen, that's easy to do. Who doesn't want to quote Calvin or Luther or C.S. Lewis in their sermons? I do it because it makes me look good and smart. Right? Years ago, I committed that I would do my best to give fresh bread every week. And that's a hard thing to do. I study scriptures for myself. I, I benefit from the scholarly efforts of others. And you hear me quote people that I admire who's impacted my life. My library is well used. It's full of books so that I read and study as I prepare these sermons. But the sermons I give have been baked in the oven of my own heart first. They come out of deep reflection, personal struggle, wrestling in prayer, reflecting on the needs of the congregation that God has given me, and then waiting on the Holy Spirit to illuminate my heart and my mind. And often, before I stand up here and present the Word of God to you, the Holy Spirit has kicked my butt over and over and over and convicted me of things that the Scripture is saying. See, a good sermon comes out of a lifetime of experience and study. It can't be put together by just opening up some commentaries here and some commentaries there and making it sound good. It comes from being with Jesus. See, mostly my prayer is that week in and week out that you don't just hear me talk, but that at the end of the day that I would give you Jesus, that I would give you the living bread of life that will transform your life. He is the bread of heaven. And listen, unless I spend time with Jesus myself, I've got no bread to give you. And if that were the case, I would have no authority to speak to you. Men, husbands, fathers, you will never have an authority in your marriage unless you feed your family. Parents, you will never have authority over your children unless you feed them the living word of God. Plato said it this way. He said, the wisest have the most authority. There is no greater wisdom than to know, live, and teach the word of the living God. Number three, authority is owned, not borrowed. Authority is owned, not borrowed. Verse 29 tells us that Jesus had an authority unlike any of the religious elite of his day. Jesus was just a country rabbi from the backwaters of Galilee. There was a saying in his hometown that there is nothing good that ever comes out of Nazareth. No one expected much to come out of Jesus' city. He never traveled more than 90 miles from his birthplace. He never went to seminary. He was never ordained by a recognized religious organization in his town. He was never wrote a book. No search committee ever invited him to become the next rabbi of their congregation. And if you search the scriptures, you'll discover that he never quoted any of the recognized Jewish scholars or authorities as did all the other seminary trained and ordained rabbis, scribes, Pharisees, and priests of his day. Watch out for people who paper their walls with diplomas 
and display the letters of their degree after their name. You can say that someone with a PhD is someone whose degree literally means probably heavily in debt. That's all it is. Feel sorry for people who try to establish their authority by telling you that they graduated from a famous college or got a high score on their SAT or they wear their title like it's some kind of extravagant jewelry. If someone has to tell you that they are smart, they're probably not smart. If they have to remind you that they are the boss, they're probably not the boss. If they have to brag about who they know or where they studied or where they've been or what they've done, what they're doing is they are telegraphing to you that they are not secure in who they are. If a shepherd of God's flock has to remind you of his degrees or appeal to his seminary training or tag his name with the reverend or the right reverend or the reverend doctor or his eminence or his holiness, then he betrays his lack of confidence in the only source of a minister's authority, which is Jesus himself and his calling on his life. And that Jesus never wore titles and never graduated from a seminary. What was the authority that left the people awestruck that day? It was an authority that was owned, not borrowed from someone else. Jesus knew exactly who he was. He knew before he did any ministry, he knew the father came down in the form of a dove and said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. He knew that his identity wasn't in what he did. His identity was that he belonged to the father. But Jesus knew that he was God. He knew that He was God in flesh that was standing in front of the people today. In God exists all legal authority. The Greek word for authority in verse 29 literally speaks of someone who has the power to make laws that conduct, that govern the conduct of the people. Kings, dictators, and rulers that make laws to make people do what they want them to do. Thomas Hobbes was a 17th century English philosopher who said, it's not wisdom, but authority that makes the most law. Jesus was God himself. He didn't have to quote Moses or any of the other rabbis to shore up his authority. He's the one who gave Moses the law on Mount Sinai. He's the, he didn't have to hang his hat on the Talmud or the Mishnah or any of the other words of theologians or scholars or thinkers of his day. He is the word incarnate. When, when Jesus speaks, everyone listens. Even the people that hated him had to pause and listen to what he said. In his classic treatise, The Prince, Machiavelli explores what it is that gives leaders authority. And he concludes that no one can long have authority with people unless they resort to divine authority. See, those of us, those people who have to remind us of their authority, whether they're speaking from a teleprompter in Washington, D.C., or they're yelling at their kids saying, you have to listen to me because I told you to do so, they'll be found out soon enough. See, I only own one thing in my life that stands the test of time. And that's this. That Jesus Christ, the King of kings and Lord of lords, abides in me. That he lives in me. That he fills me with his power and his presence. That through him that I can do all things. His Bible is in my hand. His word is in my heart. Because he owns me, I also own him as my own. My authority is owned. It's not borrowed from books or degrees or what other people say about me. The kind of authority cannot be put on a plaque or inscribed on a diploma or conferred by a title or even bought with money. It is there simply because it is there. I don't have to seize it or borrow it or prove it or fight for it or hold on to it. If it's there, other people will know. If it's not there, it doesn't matter anyway. Number four, authority is given by God, not conferred by men. Authority is given by God, not conferred by men. Jesus said to his disciples before he sent them into the world in Matthew 28, he said, all authority is given to me in heaven and in earth. Therefore, go and make disciples. See, before Jesus left heaven, God gave him the authority to be the son on earth. 
And Jesus, while he was on earth, acts on behalf of God the Father. God never gives us authority to do something without also giving us the power to accomplish what he's calling us to do. He gave Adam dominion over the Garden of Eden. He gave Moses the voice with which to speak to pharaohs. He gave David the aim to kill the giant that stood before him. He gave Elijah the power to call fire down from heaven. And he gives Jesus all authority over the angels of heaven, the demons of hell, and every power of this world. And Jesus then turns around and then confers that same authority to us as his followers and says, now go because all authority is mine. And then just to remind you of how faithful he is, he concludes the Great Commission by saying, I will be with you always. I will never leave you. I am there with you everywhere you go. Every place that you step your foot in, I am with you. You have my authority. Now go in confidence because I'm with you. See, authority is given by God. It is not conferred to us by men. But listen, we have to take what God gives us and we have to act on it. Stephen Covey says you can delegate authority, but not responsibility. God can give us authority to do all things, but we have to take responsibility to act on it. Even when Jesus was faced with the sheer horror of the cross, he relied on the authority God gave him to do what frightened him the most. In the Garden of Gethsemane, he sweated drops of blood But he was determined that he would overcome heaven and hell and everything in between when he was nailed to the cross. He would meet everything that hell would throw at him and all the wrath that heaven would pour on him and be able to say with authority on the cross, it is finished. And on the third day, he would look at the grave and he would look at the grave and he would say, roll away, I'm coming out. And he would say that with authority. And then one day, the Bible says that he will return in final authority. And scripture says that on that day, every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father in heaven. Husbands, your authority authority is not conferred to you by a marriage certificate. Parents, your authority is not conferred to you by a birth certificate. The authority of a pastor is not conferred to him by ordination papers or the call of a church. The authority of a teacher or a doctor or an attorney is not conferred by academic degrees or board certification. Your authority is not conferred to you because you're the boss or financially superior or socially elite or you can bully, intimidate, or manipulate or lord it over others. Your authority comes from God. Recognize it. It is not because of anything else you have. It is a God-given authority. And you need to live in fear and trembling of the authority that God has given you. Number five, truth is the daughter of time. Truth is the daughter of time. 400 years ago, Francis Bacon said that statement that truth is the daughter of time, not authority. See, people may speak with authority in political ads and media jingles and in college classrooms, they can. Hitler mesmerized the nation with his authoritative statements. Politicians mesmerize us with promises and even look us in the eye and say, I'm telling you the truth. But we know that their authority is hollow. Time will shine a light on the error of their ways. The mask will fall and their solutions will be shown to be ineffective and truth will expose the lie. See, that which captivates us today, that which amazes us today, will be swept away into the dustbins of forgotten history tomorrow. But 2,000 years ago, the people were awestruck by the timeless truths of Jesus' teachings. They resonated with their own experience. People somehow knew that Jesus transcended the traditions and the old teachings of their past scholars. 
There were truths given by the one who is called Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. There is, they cover everything from A to Z and nothing is left out in between. They are as relevant and truthful 2,000 years later in a small church in Richardson, Texas, as they were 2,000 years ago on the hillsides of Israel. Truth is the daughter of time. It is the timeless accuracy proved out in the lives of countless millions of people who have gone through the ages that gives us our final authority, the ageless word of the living God. Guys, we have no other foundation than the Bible. We have no other weapon of warfare than the Holy Spirit as he works in us and through us as we study the truths of God's word. Hide it in your heart. Speak it with your mouth. Live it through your actions, and you will have all the authority you need to be the husband that God's called you to be. Hide it in your heart. Speak it with your mouth. Live it through your actions, and you will have all the authority you need to be the mother that God's called you to be. Hide it in your heart. Speak it with your mouth. Live it with your life. And you will have all the authority you need to be the student that God's called you to be. To be the boss that God's called you to be. To be the employee that God's called you to be. To be the pastor that God's called you to be. To be the wife that God's called you to be, to be the lay minister that God's called you to be, to be the evangelist that God's called you to be, to be the doctor that God's called you to be, to be the student that God's called you to be, to be the teacher that God's called you to be. Hide the word of God in your heart. Speak it with your mouth and live it through your actions. And that is all the authority you need because then people will see that you live by a greater power. Let the word of God resonate through your life. See, that authority never has to be seized. That authority never has to be held on to. You don't have to prove yourself. You don't have to claim your title. You don't have to say, this is who I am. Hide it in your heart. Speak it through your mouth. Live it through your life. When you do, people will follow your life. We've got too many people that want to showcase their titles and authorities and positions. And it's meaningless because no one listens. They know they're here today and gone tomorrow. But if you live your life for God's glory, your impact will not just touch you and your family, but it will go from generation to generation to generation. Hide the word in your heart. Speak it with your mouth. But more than that, live it with your life. Don't be someone who says one thing and lives another way. Let what you study, let what you speak also reflect how you live. Because when you do that, you don't have to prove a thing. You don't have to show who you are or tell people what you know, they'll know because they'll see Jesus residing in and through you. The presence and the power of Jesus will be so evident in your life. You students, hide this word in your heart. When you're on your campus, live it out through your actions. And those people that you're praying for, they will come to know Jesus. Why? because they will see Jesus in you. You don't have to win a theological argument with them. You don't have to prove the existence of God to them. They will just see that there is a great and living God that lives because they see him in your life. Hide it in your heart. Speak it through your mouth. Live it through your life. And then the world would see that we live by a greater authority. We live 
for Jesus. Would you pray with me? Father, there's so much that you have placed us responsible over. And often we try to do the things you've given us authority over by our own power. We think our wisdom, knowledge, abilities, or talents, or skills are, is what enables us to do the things you've called us to do, but it's not. We know that unless we're close to you, unless that we are feeding on the bread of living life, unless we are close to Jesus, we'll never be able to give life-changing bread to those you have placed us in authority over. And so, God, this morning, I pray that you would convict us of trying to lord over other people or think that we are superior to other people or think that our titles or degrees or positions or what, whatever it is is what makes us who we are. Would you help us to be so secure in knowing that our identity is found in the fact that we belong to you? That even when we were not lovable, you loved us. When we were orphans and strangers, you came into our mess, into our lives, and you redeemed us. And you made us a part of the family of God. You said that we are brothers and sisters with Jesus. And the authority that you gave Jesus on this earth is the authority that now you have given to us as your disciples. Help us to live out that authority, not in a manipulative way, but help us to live that out with fear and trembling, knowing that this authority comes from you. Father, this morning as we come to the table, we recognize that the only reason we have this authority is because Jesus left the throne of heaven and he was born a baby. No power, no control. He lived a life that we should have lived. And then he died the death that we should have died. He was taken and beaten and abused and crucified. As a criminal on the cross, he was left to die. But because of his death and resurrection, we sit here with the authority that you have given us. Help us not to take for granted what Jesus has done for us. Help us not to take for granted that we sit here because there was a price that was prayed for our salvation. As we come to the table this morning, we come acknowledging you are Lord and we are your servants. We acknowledge that you are the one that is working and you have called us to be a part of that. So we come humbly and we say thank you. Thank you for loving us, saving us, redeeming us. Thank you for all that you're doing in us. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. This morning.